That doesn't look like a factory to me. Architecture was a lot different back then. Also shows you one more thing. I think this is kind of a neat thing about the era when this was built and heat was still an issue, so they had to have fireplaces all over. So all the chimneys. Because you have to have a fireplace in all the rooms. So I think that's kind of a cool little shot of the way they had to do things then. But and that's a stand off in front of the factory. The American Railway Union, led by Eugene Victor Debs, they if you think I'm gonna throw this people, it's a bowling ball. Oh, it's hard. It's too light. Ah, too light. So, Eugene Debs and the American Railway Union. See, you gave me a toy. Thank you. <laughs> That'd be kind of cool to palm on a bowling ball. You got to admit, that would be cool. So, stay. And we do have a box. We have bowling pins back in that box. So we, yeah. So we can set up the bowling alley here at last day of school. We did that a couple years ago. It was much louder. A few people got a little disturbed. Catch! Yeah, I got, I got bowling pins. I'm always prepared. Well, the American Railway Union, they realized it could happen to them. And devs realized that we must stick together as all workers. So they boycotted trains that used Pullman cars. They call that not crossing the picket line. And what happened is railway traffic all across the country stopped. And there were a couple standoffs. Here's a standoff between troops and, and workers and, and workers who sympathize against them. But here's the thing. Richard Olney, who was the same guy who convinced Congress to vote for the ICC and said we could muddle it up, he is now the Attorney General. And he came up with a great idea. Put mail cars on every train. It is the constitutional duty of the United States government to deliver the mail. So then they can say the strikers are, in, are stopping a constitutional action by the federal government to make sure the mail is delivered. And over state lines, that's the Commerce Clause. Remember interstate commerce? We talked about that with one versus Illinois and all that. So they did that, and then Cleveland can make statements like this. As you can see, he will do whatever it takes to deliver that mail, meaning implying send in the troops. This would be the excuse then to break the union and make the strike one of the most violent in American history. So with that Commerce Clause, they went to the Supreme Court and got a, or a federal court, and got a court order called an injunction. The injunction ordered the American Railway Union back to work to deliver the mail. They didn't do it. Debs realized this is a scam, and that allowed Cleveland to call the truth. And remember what? White strikers were the need to protect troops. Black troops take advantage of racism. And that is a conflict in Chicago. Over 300 people would be killed and wounded in the fight. Deaths would be arrested. The union would be broken. Now, this was set to say, this actually changed a lot of things, but down the road, and we'll get to it, were workers' rights. But that's coming. But you combine these two things, it doesn't look like revolution. This is big, kind of like the great, great upheaval. We have an army marching on Washington, D.C. Don't forget Coxie's army, because something very similar to this is going to happen during the Great Depression, called the Bonus Army. It's amazing how history just kind of keeps repeating itself. And then we'll have the march on Washington in 63, and the one that became one of the poor person march in 68. We have a, a, there's a lot of stuff like this in history. So with that, one thing about Debs, after the Pullman strike, Debs became a full-fledged socialist. He realized, to his point of view, the capitalist system is completely flawed. The workers need more rights and protection. He would run five more times, including, I mentioned this once before, when he was in prison. And that's the buck for him when he opposed World War I, and he got a million votes in 1920 from a prison cell. Hey, war, personal freedom, civil rights go out the window. He was arrested for criticizing the war, criticizing the government. So, war is kind of scary. Yeah. If he would have been elected as president and released from jail, that's a really hard one. 
This has never been happened before. There's no constitutional. There's nothing in the Constitution that says a prisoner can't. He's not saying he's trying to hurt himself one time. <laughs> Like, that is a really weird. I mean, that they, yeah, yeah. Actually, that's not clear if a president can pardon a president. Probably can't, but uh, um, the current president is asked to be pardoned himself. So it might be a constitutional question. Who knows? So, yeah, that's one of the weird what ifs. And I was in New Orleans about 50 years ago. That wasn't that long ago. Ah, years. Hi, class. And I was in this antique store, and they had that button for sale. And it wasn't that much. It was like fifteen dollars, and I was like, "Oh, I don't need it." And I was like, oh, "I've never seen another one like it." It was like one of those. Hey, when you have a chance like that, yeah, that happened. Two different things. I'll show you the other one here in just a second. So I'm really disappointed in myself. But that's going to lead to the election of 1896. And the reason we have this massive pig dog on here is because okay, before we get to the pig dog, right down 1896, the populace thought they had a real shot. The Democrats and Republicans were the same. Both laissez fair for the most part. Social Darwinistic. The populists say, we have a third way. And they thought they could be a new party. Or new, one of the new, or a new uh, member of the two top parties. Remember, we have winner take all. So we're stuck with two parties. And there hasn't been one of the two parties collapsed since the Whigs. Remember the Whigs collapsed and the Republicans took over. That's, that's back in 1984. So we've got two main parties. And yeah, there are a lot of problems with that, but when it's winner take all, that's what you got. Every country that's winner take all has two main parties. And so with this, this is this pig dog is supposed to be the United States. And by the way, aren't those freakishly small legs? And it's supposed to say all these states want free silver. Remember, free silver meant inflation, the populist idea. Gold, this is the gold standard, and they say silver dog with a gold tail. Most of the country wants silver, but the tail, the northeastern industrial financial reasons. Will the tail like the dog or the dog like the tail? And so, do you like the pig dog? I know, I, I could tell this class would really appreciate pig dogs. So with that, the Republicans nominated McKinley. McKinley was not considered the sharpest tack, but he did have all kinds of motor vehicles out here. I'm scared of that high test. Fast um, killing materials. So McKinley was the governor of Ohio, and the thing was, there was a whole run of governors from Ohio. Grant was born in Ohio. You know, grew up in Illinois. Hayes, Ohio, Garfield, Ohio, Harrison, Ohio, and now McKinley. The Republican Party, or the, the Ohio ran the Republican Party, pretty much. It was, that was just, it was such an important state because all, they always knew Ohio would go Republican back then. And so here's McKinley. And the big thing about McKinley was he looked like a president should. Get this down, image. He had the image they want. Remember William Henry Harrison, the log cabin campaign, Timmy Canoe and Tyler too. Harrison, they didn't let him talk, but he betrayed the image of Andrew Jackson. Same thing here. McKinley would give speeches that said nothing. In fact, he was not a good speaker at all, but still free radio and um, they just had the phonograph, but you could buy them. They give out records of speeches, but not many people did yet. He didn't say much, like Harrison, but he represented what people thought, this upstanding, kind of a, a very serious man. That's what they, they wanted as president. He looks kind of ghoulish here, I think. But the reason McKinley became presidential nominee, because this man ran the Republican Party, Marcus Hanna. Hanna controlled it. He was a millionaire. He was laws I fair, social Darwinism completely. Wanted to stay on the gold standard. No government aid for the massive numbers of unemployed that were still unemployed in 1896. Whenever they drew a cartoon of Hannah, they always had the dollar signs. Dollar signs everywhere. It was all for money. Even camp, even cartoons that were Republican showed social dollar signs with them. And look how they draw McKinley as an absolute dope. 
and he was kind of adult. They made a big deal that he was at Antietam, but he served coffee to General Burnside. And if you go to Antietam, he was a orderly. But there's a massive monument for McKinley, and he served coffee. That's what he did. But, you know, you become president. And Henry Clay had this reputation, remember Clay, the great compromiser, as being this, you know, only do what's morally right and best for the country. Now, that's not quite true, but he had that reputation. So that's supposed to be Clay. And there's Hannah. Hannah, that man Clay was an ass. It's better to be president than to be white, meaning morally white. And McKinley, unlike his opponent, McKinley gave virtually no speeches, made no appearances, except if they'll call it the front porch campaign. That is the front porch of the governor's mansion in Columbus, Ohio. Still the governor's mansion. A couple guards out there. And he would kind of make an appearance and let the press see him. They might hand out pamphlets or maybe they'll make a statement. And they would have tours come and he'd kind of stand there and wave to them. And that would be it. The front porch campaign. Let his surrogates go out, Hannah's surrogates, and push, he stands for stability. And that was represented by the gold standard. Don't go to something crazy that will create inflation and destroy the economy. You know what money's worth if it's tied to gold. No, actually, it's not true. Money's much more volatile when it's based on gold. But it sounds like it's more stable because gold is something you can see, you can feel, you can touch it. It's heavy. And so they pushed out. The Democrats are in disarray. Cleveland wants to be renominated, but he supports the gold standard. And the Democrats are being pushed more and more by the populists. In fact, it's argued that over half of the Democrats were free silver. Remember, free silver just simply meant inflation. Either paper money or more coinage of silver. And the real worry was if Cleveland would have got the nomination, McKinley will win for sure because the populists will get a lot of their votes. By the way, who's this again? That's Baby Ruth. Who likes Baby Ruth candy bars? Who's had one? And you don't like them? Yeah, I agree. They're not they didn't compare to Kit Kats, right? Good working man's food. Well, they had a hung convention, and then this man got up to give a speech. 36 years old. Junior congressman from Nebraska, even though he was born in Chicago, William Jennings Bruff. I better be careful, I'll pull up an accident with somebody. Broken two rulers like that. Yeah, bang! And a couple overheads. Okay, so we lie like that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so Anna did this mark here. <laughs> that was a tap. So with that, William Jennings Bryan. Now, think about 10,000 people. And by the way, the populace got so po popular, sorry about that, that the Democrats wanted to, to do their convention to take advantage of populist popularity. Where did they have their convention? Omaha, the greatest city on earth. And so, Omaha, it's the crossroads of civilization, right? Yeah, it's beautiful. But there are 10,000 people in this hot, kind of temporary convention center. And Brian got to give his speech. He's going to be done the cross of both speech. He's not technically running, but of course he's, he's ambitious. But he's still very young. If he would have been elected, he'd be the youngest man ever to be president. And he gave maybe the greatest political speech in history. After about 15 minutes of the speech, there's always those political speeches, there'll be applause lines, and everybody claps. They quit clapping. They were just enthralled. He had them in the palm of his hand. And he had them up and down, laughing and almost crying. And it had populist themes, but no real specifics. But it ended with just a great crescendo. So let me read you the speech. Here it is. It'll take about three days, so get comfortable. Day one. No, I'll read you about the last couple of Jack. He's a Democrat, yeah. But he had populist like theme. He had that populist theme. So the pop populist party was becoming really popular with populist ideas in the Democratic Party. So 
Now, a lot of people would accuse him of being a populist, but he actually he wasn't. So if they dare come out in the open field and defend the gold standard is a good thing, we will fight them to the uttermost. Having behind us the producing masses of this nation and the world, supported by the commercial interests, the laboring interests, and the toilers everywhere. We will answer their demand for a gold standard by saying to them, you shall not press down upon this brow of labor, this crown of thorns. And right when he said the crown of thorns, everyone just quiet. He waited about five seconds. And he was like, oh, you see, where's this going to go? What a gift he had. He had him. Then he finished with, you shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. About five seconds, people were silent. And then you Euphoria. They jumped up on their seats and started screaming and chanting. They're like, that's the greatest speech ever. I'm not really sure what it meant, but it's great. It's something religious and there's gold, but I don't care. And they stormed the stage. There's no photograph of it, but they picked him up on his shoulders and carried him around. And by acclamation at that moment, he got the Democratic nomination for president. And for the next 25 years, he'd be one of the most popular and important politicians in American history. Just overnight, from nobody to this incredibly important man, because he was really young. And he'd run for president three times. He'd be a secretary of state. He'd be always instrumental in democratic politics, but also kind of the, many of the failures of democratic politics. And here are the civil rights taking over the Democratic Party. This is actually mocking him that it's all for a bunch of debt, and here comes anarchy. But he did great, but what party is going to meet in Omaha two weeks after this? And they're going, you've got to be kidding. He stole our thunder. They really thought they could steal a bunch of Democrats and take over for the Democrats as one of the two main parties. And now, here's Brian. What do they do? They nominate Brian too. So the populists nominated Brian. So get that down. The populists rolled the dice. They basically gave their party up. We will run with the Democrats. It's all or nothing. That might have been the best decision. Roll the die, go with them. But by doing that, the populist party would die. Yes, it's going to be an important part. Their ideas of progressive and future politicians. But I like this cartoon because it's implying that Brian is a populist. He's the head of the snake swallowing the Democrats, but in reality, it was the other way around. And here is a very crude populist cartoon of workers being crucified on a cross of gold. And that's Hannah, who's that? And like a little emperor, like a little Napoleon, even though he's just little and in the pocket of Hannah. But then remember the racist element, Rothschilds. Jewish banker. So it tells you a lot about that. Isn't it interesting that the populace hated social Darwinism, the idea that one class is greater than another, and yet they held many racist ideas of one race above another? It is contradictory, but, but anti-social Darwinism eventually would lead to civil rights, would lead to women's rights. So it's just down the road. So. Brian's campaign was amazing. And immediately, both sides broke off into like almost like cultural camps. Gold versus silver. They called them gold bugs versus silver bugs. And people started wearing these pins. And if you represented gold, as I said before, that's stability, stable economy. You know what your money stands for. No fly by night, which is the name for a, like a, a crooked company. No fly by night money. Where silver came representing, we represent the people, higher wages, better living conditions, higher prices for farmers, you'll get out of debt, silver. They're simplifying both, but it became, you know, I wear this pin, that's who I am. This is a cultural indicator for me. You see that politics today, I mean, that's one thing if you see since uh, the election of President Trump, um, the red hats. That's a cultural indicator they want people to think certain things about them. So we saw this too, and I was at the same store in New Orleans and had those pens. Those two pens for sale. They were like $30. And 
And I think that's why I didn't buy the first one. I was like, I don't know which one to buy. They're kind of expensive. God. It's a hint. Christmas present. Festivus. Really Festivus present. Think about it. And I want both of them. I want all of these four. Actually, those are cool. So, with that, Brian toured the country. In the two, they would call this a whistle stop campaign because he was the first candidate to actively campaign for himself, not just a few speeches. He went all over the Midwest hoping to get these states they thought of, the populists thought, or the Democrats. If we can get here, we can win this election. And 16 to 1, that means 16 ounces of gold will equal one ounce of, I'm sorry, 16 ounces of silver will equal one ounce of gold. That would be the ratio to try to get more money in circulation. But they also wanted paper currency, too. Here's another one. Uh, here's the gold camel. I know it's a pretty, it's not a great cartoon. But these are the dogs of the rabbit dogs of the gold standard. And who's defending the people? The creepy Brian lion. <laughs> <laughs> lion, Brian, lion. No, uh, for free silver. Lion. Lion? Hmm. I, I'm just trying to remember, is there a story of the line? Okay, moving on. That's his first trip. If people came out to see him, I mean, you can imagine how Ryan really, really thought, and the Democrats, we can win this. But the problem is this, nobody lives in the rural areas for the most part. They don't have as many electors. You get all these people out, but in the big cities, that's where they were hurt. The, the McKinley campaign, Put up newspapers, they had speeches at factories. In fact, they employers would bring out all the workers and make it very clear. If you vote for that dangerous Brian and his free silver idea, the economy will crash and you'll all lose your job. In fact, they would make it also very clear. We'll we will fire you if you vote for Brian. This is pre-secret ballot. So they your boss would stand there and watch you vote. Sure, sure. Yeah. Or at least that's one of the big reforms they're going to call the Australian ballot of the secret ballot. Because Australian, of course, right? And so the other thing is this. Oh, here's a Brock O'Brien speeches. And I like this one. You can see him right there and here giving the speech. But I love this one. The only reason I put that one in there, that's actually 1908 when he was running for president. But his speeches, he would get them all laughing and crying. And he would have them all just overjoyed. But two things. First off, by 1908, he had been going pretty bald. And they saw the picture of him from 1896 when he had hair. And secondly, look at this guy. <laughs> he must have been like, geez, I've heard this speech a hundred times. Not again. <laughs> and one more thing. His speeches were like an evangelical Christian, Protestant Christian revival. It was very Protestant Christian. I mean the same language. He really put a lot of that revival idea, like uh, um, these tent revivals, that turned off urban voters, especially the New Catholic immigrants. That really turned them off. While the Republicans, they pushed as like, if you vote for the Democratic hit or vote for free silver, will be prosperous like Guatemala at eight cents an hour. Prosperous like uh, South America, 20 cents a day, 50 cents a day in Japan. Implying that all these countries have terrible economies because they went to free solar. Now, that actually isn't what happened, but who knows that? You know, most people don't know that. I remember I had someone tell me that the Canadian healthcare system is basically, you know, they just they don't treat anybody. It's a disaster. It's filthy and dirty. Really? And it's all good, so. I've had people tell me that, so they don't know when you think we've never been there. And uh, no, Canada actually they live longer in here, so they're pretty good. I think it might just be because they're partially frozen, but that's another story. Here's another one showing this mob following Brian, but look at the stable army of the gold standard, the national honor, defending against this motley crew. But there's something else really big. Brian would raise $300,000. That was an unheard of amount by 1896. Nobody raised that much money for campaigns yet. Johnny Rockefeller was the head of what company? Do you remember? 
Standard Oil. John D. Rockefeller gave $300,000. He, he himself gave it to McKinley through Hannah. Hannah raised seven million. Seven million for Brian. So if Brian could go to these whistle, whistle stop campaigns and people come out and cheer, not realizing, realizing all that money is discrediting silver, scaring people, and making McKinley look stable. And it worked. When the election came out, this is one of the most important elections in history. Not because it was close, because actually, McKinley won by four percentage points, and pretty handily in the Electoral College. And this map, red is, red is Democrats. But it changed everything. On the surface, people thought, yes, yeah, stability won in the gold standard. But these are the, here's the gold standard winning. Sound money. But these are the reasons why this election is so important. Number one, urban interests became dominant. As cities grew, urban. And that means especially finance and banks. They became more important than ever before. Rural interests would become standard. It's kind of funny because politicians, a lot to this day, will act like they care about rural interests, but everything is urban. Everything. Next, money became more important than ever before. But here's the thing money, what you got to get is this money allows you to sell your interest. Sell the image. With the new media back then, TV, pamphlets, press, soon record players, then wireless radio, television, movies. And then today we have how many different types of media bombard you? It's, it's all kind of overwhelming. And they can create an image. And the image, it's a twofold thing. Not only the image you want people to believe about yourself, but create an image for your opponent. And it is shockingly effective. By the way, we're not talking anything about government or honest people. Now it's just become the image. My favorite is when dishonest people then will portray themselves as the image of honest people. And it works really well. But lastly, what if reform? This will trigger a whole series of reforms. No, laws of our capitalism is going to change, at least in the short run. There'll be many of the things the Populist one will come in the progressive era just 10 years later in the New Deal under Franklin Roosevelt in the 1930s and 40s and 50s, culminating with LBJ's Great Society in the 60s. And populist ideas, including, you know, or, or including from taxation to regulation to direct election of senators, all those things happen. And yes, they were racist, but their anti-social Darwinistic feeling would lead to this idea, well, Men and women are equal. That will come from that anti-socialist or anti-social Darwinistic idea and civil rights. It's a direct line. That's where you get the weird kind of thing where you can have a, these races be the roots of anti-racism. Remember the Industrial Revolution? It took away rights for women, but it would be the roots for women to demand equal rights. It's a weird kind of contradiction that those can happen. Sometimes you almost are in a frustrating way necessary. So with that, guess what's a parable of populism? All movies, including this movie, The Wizard of Oz. L. Frank Bond was a populist. He wrote The Wizard of Oz about populism. Remember the line? Farmers who really do have power and are smart, but people think they're dumb. Oh, that's the scarecrow. Industrial workers, but they need to show that they have the heart to join this movement. All people, it's kind of like a generic person, you can, rational people can make the right decision. By the way, how do they get the bus on the Tin Man? The chocolate. What color shoes did Dorothy wear? That was for the movie. In the book, silver, green, silver. The Emerald City, green. They wanted paper money. The Wizard of Oz, Oz is the abbreviation for ounce. Yeah, it's a parable of populism. And uh, uh, it, the, the first one is really good, then the books get pretty shaky. And I got, I think the movie's great. Actually, we have watched that at, 
after the AP exam. It's a fun thing. We, in last year, I think we did special topics. We did a little mini on populism and talked about the history of it. So let's go one more thing. The bell is ringing. But imperialism. What is imperialism? Do you remember? What do you want to create? Empire. Empire. Empire means imp, that imp, how can you say imp, imp, empire? Imperialism is empire. For profit. It's for profit. And it could be money, it could be prestige. And the bell's about ready to ring to get this last thing. We gotta get this last thing, so quit whining. Remember mercantilism? That's what it is. Go into colonies and gouge out their wealth. And there's two different ways. I want to knock the talk tomorrow. It's colonial, and that means literally conquering an area, put up your flag. Here's German um, colonists in Southwest Africa, Namibia today. Those are hot talks. Look at the chains from that. That's a British, she's colonial British rule in Burma. Or economic, where the mother country literally takes over another country. Which one will the United States do the most of? Economic, and that is a Mex or that's a Cuban cartoon showing American in economic imperialism. That's actually a pretty scary one. That's really uh, scary. There are reasons today why today there are a lot of distrust of the United States in Latin America. 